This is a vinegar room, and they are arachnids, and they are harmless to people. They can spray out a little vinegar spray. You wouldn't want to get it in your eyes or anything like that, and so I'm being very gentle with it since it's close to my face. Wouldn't recommend that you put it on your face. You'll see people doing stuff like that on social media sometimes. Um, this is about as far as it could uh, spray me. Um, but uh, in terms of bites, you don't have to worry about that. I've handled tons and tons of them. I've never been bitten, and um, they don't have any venom or anything like that either. They have claws, sort of like a scorpion does. Uh, they're pedipalps up there. And uh, unlike scorpions that have like two parts, they actually have three parts to theirs. You can see just through my voice, uh, this animal, it can't see. And so my voice, uh, they're very sensitive to vibrations. And so you saw it perhaps recoil a few times. They use these modified front legs to tap around and feel the world around them. And they probably um, are able to detect chemical cues from other vinegaroons and animals around them as well. So, um, this video that I'm putting up here, oh, sorry, I have to not direct my voice towards our friend here. I'm gonna put it down here for just a moment while I talk to you guys so we don't stress her out. Um, she's not a mature specimen, by the way. She'll get, uh, she, by the time she's mature, she will have twice this mass here. Um, this is a special video that I'm putting out right now. You guys weren't expecting to see this video, I don't think. And uh, this is the first video where I begin to answer your questions from the active contest that is going on right now. If you pop back to the prior video, you can see the rules, uh, listen to the rules as I explain them in the video, and participate in the contest. You have a chance for the next 24 hours until Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. I'm in Oregon. Uh, you have the opportunity to participate in that contest and um, win three great prizes. So please check that out. And um, you can, if you've already asked a question, you can begin to watch my video responses to those questions here. And then in the contest, ask your own question if you haven't yet asked a question. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you again with more answers in another video very soon. And we will, once the contest is over, of course, also select the winners through the random number picker. Say goodbye to the vinegar. You guys can see my sweatshirt here. The one of the sponsors for this contest. Also, who donated this philium leaf insect sticker? Shapes in Nature. And they make these wonderful sweatshirts. I love it. And uh, I'll also mention again that the second place prize in this contest is this sticker sheet right here. This was the third place prize from Shapes in Nature. Second place prize from the Portland Insectarium, pdxinsectarium.org. This was sheepsandnature.com. And um, the first place prize, of course, is a trio of Blue Death Feigning Beetles, which I am able to sex for you guys if you want males or females. Um, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but uh, the difference in males and females, the way to tell the difference between them is that the males have fine CT, these little sort of coppery colored hairs that line their antennae while the females lack these. I thought I would move up here and make the video in a different location than usual. You guys are probably um, very accustomed now to the backdrop behind me. I usually film down there. Um, I have my laptop here where I'm going to be reading your questions in a comfortable sitting position. And uh, I thought I'd try the light here. Hopefully the acoustics are okay. 
Sounds like my voice is very loud to me. I've always had sort of a loud voice anyway. So we will now get to your questions here and keep in mind that I will be using a random number picker that will look through all of these questions between now, which is Friday evening. I'm getting an early start on answering these questions because you never know how many there are going to be and I don't want to find myself on Sunday evening, now three days from tonight, um, having to do everything last minute because, um, well, we all know what procrastination is like. So the first question here is from ShepDot. ShepDot uh, is a regular commenter here on my channel and uh, Shepard, I want to say, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, I appreciate your comments. Um, all of my regulars, I really appreciate you guys. You guys can see how much time and effort I'm putting into this YouTube channel. And um, well, I won't say too much about that because I had noticed there was a question about that. Um, I often do sort of preview the questions as they come in, um, you know, hit the like button and everything. I don't answer them there, but I try to give a brief reply just to let you guys know that um, I have seen your question and I will be answering it in the, uh, in the video that I make, which you are watching now. So starting with Chef Dot here. Well, that was my daughter interrupting the phone call. She was at a pet store and wanted to have a conversation with me about a dog. <laughs> she has long wanted a dog or a cat and uh, we don't do dogs or cats here, as you guys probably know, because just listen. That's the beautiful sound of silence. Where were we? I just ordered a blue death fainting beetle along with some of the other darklings. I hope I can win these next three. What is your favorite beetle? Um, I will always get the favorite questions and that's just fine because uh, I know some of you, you know, maybe just be phoning it in with you know the easiest, quickest question you can think of because it's all about the win for you, <laughs> maybe. Or, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you really do want to know my favorite beetle. I'm not really sure, but um, I absolutely do not have a favorite beetle. Uh, interestingly, beetles were thought for the longest time to be the most speciose, the most numerous group, order, what have you, the number of species on the planet for just one group. Um, but I heard uh, last year that parasitic wasps are now thought to be more numerous in terms of species than beetles are. To pick a favorite when not all of them are even known to science, when not all of them have been seen by human beings, almost seems unfair to me. And that's just part of my reluctance. Um, I've said a million times before, it's the diversity that I like. I like that um, there is more than one kind of pizza. And if I eat uh, pepperoni pizza every day, I'm quickly going to tire of it. Um, so same thing with beetles. I, I want to experience a beetle I have never seen before. I want my mind to be blown by this other organism that has been on the planet for so many millions of years longer than the species I represent as a human being. I see it and, and here is this ancient organism, um, you know, in my opinion, that has descended from a common ancestor of me. And, you know, it's, it's another earthling like I am and I have a kinship with it. Um, but, you know, in the same way, I'm not going to pick a favorite child um, and it, and it won't be the one that interrupts my videos, I'll tell you that much, just kidding. Um, I can't pick a favorite beetle or a favorite anything else. I can make an attempt at answering the question, but it will never be a simple answer <laughs> or a short one. Uh, next question by I Quitted. How many of your bugs are wild caught? I've always wondered this. Um, I don't 
honestly know the answer to that question. Uh, my inventory rotates in and out so frequently. I do always know whether something is captive bred or captive raised or wild caught. Those are the three categories. Um, but uh, I don't know how many, you know, every day is a cycle of birth and death around here. Uh, every day is a cycle of getting new things in and selling things. And so it's a constantly rotating thing. This is also kind of a, a touchy topic for a lot of people. Um, you know, slippery slope. I, I try not to say too much about this topic because it's sort of like religion for some people or politics. And here in social media, um, you know, it's, it's a very di divisive atmosphere. And I'm always trying to just make sure that we're all having a good time here. I do me, you do you, boo. And, you know, we just agree to disagree on things. And, um, you know, we, we look for the things in each other. Uh, we build those bridges so that we can find what's common between us. And um, through this channel, it's my intention to, um, you know, not do what I've done for a good portion of my life, waste my time arguing with people who don't feel the same way I feel about things. Instead, I want to uh, sail through the rest of my life gently and uh, peacefully doing <clears throat> what I have always done and what I like to do, surrounded and including people that like the same sort of things. So, Megan Ma, my question would be, what factors do you consider when it comes to determining whether or not something is a good beginner pet species? I am looking to get a scorpion and I don't really know what to look for aside from the ratio between pincher sizes and stinger sizes. Um, it, it can be a common misconception that uh, the pincher sizes or the stinger sizes or the size of the scorpion is a reflection of how venomous it is. For example, here in the United States, a medium sized species that we have here is the Arizona bark scorpion and it happens to be our most venomous species in the country. It's medium in size, it's slender, it has a very long tail, um, its claws and its body are much bigger than many other species in this country, but it is also considerably smaller than other species that we have in this country. And so I would caution you, uh, not that you, Megan, are a person who is going to go out there and just um, casually or randomly grab every scorpion you see on the basis of things you read on the internet. Uh, I would, but you have to be careful about what you read on the internet. And, um, you know, we have desert hairy scorpions in this country, they're about that long and they have large claws and a large stinger. And then we have tiny little species like um, uh, Domensis superstitiona, superstitionensis, I don't know. Anyway, there's lots of small species of scorpions and, um, as far as what makes a beginner, a good beginner species, uh, you know, scorpions by and large are relatively low maintenance animals. Um, for example, I had one that uh, I shipped to a customer, a desert hairy scorpion. Uh, and recently it was returned to me after sitting at their post office for six to eight weeks, I think it was. And I mean, obviously this is a horrible thing for a creature to have to go through. Um, but then again, you consider that these animals in the desert during winter months, they spend months and months maybe six or eight months in their burrows just waiting for spring to pop again and bug season to start again and the rains to come so that they emerge and mass feed for a few months before hunkering back down for the colder months when um, bugs and other things aren't available. Um, it was returned to me in perfect condition. Um, and uh, even though the desert areas, they, they can be a sensitive species in shipping when it comes to um, cold temperatures or especially hot temperatures, um, 
they are very low maintenance. They have a uh, low metabolism. A lot of desert species do have a low metabolism. And so um, they can stretch like, like camels and you know they can take on the water in large amounts and then stretch it out for a very long time without dehydrating or dying from dehydration. Whereas you put a person in the desert for a few days and they dehydrate long before they starve. Um, so I would say that uh, ruling out extremely venomous scorpions uh, a good beginner pet species is a scorpion that is not going to do harm to you if you're a new keeper or a young person um, or if you know yourself to be a person who likes to take a lot of chances putting your hand in the tank instead of using a long pair of tongs um, or if you're that kind of person that um, you know likes to tempt fate and maybe hold something that is venomous, you know, like a death stalker scorpion. It's extremely venomous. It's going to mess you up for a minimum of a few days if you take a sting off one. Um, so uh, I personally don't sell any hot species. And what I mean by that is species that are medically significant. For example, I won't uh, ship or sell black widows or brown recluses or any kind of scorpion that um, can uh, be the cause of a, a visit to the doctor. Um, probably the most venomous things I sell, um, and, and these could warrant a trip uh, to the doctor too, are um, assassin bugs and uh, velvet ants. Um, the stings are very powerful, and if you find yourself in a position after taking a bite or sting off of something or anything, or a rusty nail, or a dog, um, common sense, go to the doctor if you're not sure about how you're feeling or what's going to happen next. And if you're having breathing problems, especially get there as soon as you can. So, um, you know, desert harries, uh, any of the small desert species here in the United States, excluding bark scorpions, um, you know, they're, they're all great beginner species in my opinion, easy to care for. And uh, their con the containment on them is, is very simple the most basic care sheet. Almost every care sheet that you read online for scorpions will uh, be okay for them. Um, almost everyone. Alec Becker, what's the coolest color mantis you've ever kept? I've seen some really cool blue bark mantises recently and they were stunning. I believe they were Theopompa servilii, but they were gorgeous, servili, but they were gorgeous but I was wondering if there were any other odd colored mantids. Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I mentioned this one in a recent video. My favorite species in terms of coloration, if you discount, you know, super flashy ones, obviously like an orchid mantis with the pink and white. I don't love the way the adults look once they get their wings, but the nymphs themselves, and you've seen them in some of my recent videos, with their white bodies, the wide lobes, um, they look a lot like orchids, um, pink lining hues, areas on their bodies, gorgeous specimens. Um, a species that I really like is Hiradula venosa, the golden giant mantis, giant Asian golden mantis. Lots of common names, different ways of saying them. Um, and uh, among a few shades of green, they will uh, pop out some yellows sometimes. I mentioned recently uh, two-tone uh, specimens that I've seen before where they're green on the top and then their wings are yellow. Very attractive, but um, I've seen a few examples of what we call rose gold in that species where the specimen is uh, mostly golden color, but it has rosy hues through that gold. And that's one that I uh, I particularly like to raise that species to adulthood and then see that coloration come out in the final molt. Always very pretty. My question is, do you keep isopods? If so, what is your favorite? I do have quite a few isopods and it's interesting when people, um, this is Thoropods on YouTube. Um, it's interesting to me when uh, people come to these uh, question and answer contests and I can tell from his question or her question 
that they are not really familiar with me and uh, my website that has been up for uh, 2020, for 23 years now. And so, um, yes, I do keep many isopods. I do sell them on my website in small colonies, starter groups. Um, there's a lot of demand for them. They're extremely hot. There are a lot of dealers of them around right now. As for a favorite species, hmm, that's really, really tough. Uh, I mean, you, it's not a fair answer, but I would say my favorite species are the, uh, I think the genus is Bathyoma or something like that, the deep, giant deep sea isopods. My friend Don Elon has a video that went viral on them where he pins one. Um, he had managed to acquire a specimen uh, from, I don't know, someone that went deep sea diving or something um, all through official channels and everything. I don't think you're allowed to collect them. He also has some, some lice off of whales that he was able to acquire through um, uh, a Native American tribe, tribe that is, uh, collects uh, whales for food, hunts them, I guess is the word. Um, anyway, um, that, that would be a good contender for my favorite species. Um, and uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm kind of boring. Uh, I have a sentimental feeling about Armadillidium vulgare, um, the common pill bug that we see in many of our backyards. Um, <clears throat> comes in a lot of different colors, uh, the patterning on them. Um, they're not native to our area, but um, they're one of the things that I can see uh, most of the year round. And it's just nice to go outside and to be able to depend on um, being able to see something out there moving around that is loosely defined as a bug. And so I like them a lot too. Um, oh, and I haven't seen a rubber ducky before, so I'm very interested to see one of those someday. We all know they're here. We just haven't all seen them yet. Um, I'm curious to know what would be your least favorite bug. I touched on this in a prior contest where I said it was the mosquito and because, um, it is the number one most deadly animal on the planet in terms of the harm and suffering and death that it causes to human beings. Insects are animals. What was the worst insect bite or sting I've ever gotten? Um, I would have to say a honeybee sting. I'm uh, not deathly allergic to them, but um, I took a sting a few years ago, I guess it's been about five years ago now because I'm still working at UPS and I had to take two days off from work because of it, which a lot of people thought was ridiculous. But you know, when you explain to them that like some people actually die from allergic reactions to honeybee stings, they're like, okay. Um, but my, my whole arm had swollen up. I think I was uh, stung on the arm and you know, I, I, I swelled up here. I had a big boob on one side of my body. And uh, so, I mean, I know it's not a, a, a terribly interesting answer and I have uh, I've just never been bitten or stung by anything that I keep. It's probably mind-blowing and uh, sounds unrealistic or impossible to anybody listening but um, I suppose I'm excessively careful. I've had some close calls. I've had like centipede um, you know like like lightly graze me, like kind of more of a scratch. It didn't actually go below the surface because I pulled my hand back very quickly. Um, I've done, a, I've had a few close calls in the past where I'm opening up assassin bug cages and they're on the lid and I don't realize it and, you know, lots of little things like that. I've helped tons of spiders. Um, and for the record, I've never felt like one was going to bite me. Um, and I've never been bitten by a spider um, aside the odd bump on my body that I've witnessed at one time or another that I cannot say with certainty it was a spider that bit me, even though the symptoms, uh, the symptoms of it were much different than what I get from fleas or uh, mosquitoes, which I've experienced countless times. Uh, let's see. And they said, thanks for doing all of these. I love them. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate your question. Um, oh, that was, that was the last one, my least favorite bug. And Janet T. 
asks, what are the best isopods for bioactive enclosures? Um, I don't think there is a best species of isopod. Um, it really depends on what you mean by bioactive. I assume that what you mean by that is that um, there is another pet in the tank that is feeding and generating waste in the tank. Um, actually, let me read the rest of your question because it speaks to this. I have a leopard gecko and may possibly upgrade him to a bioactive enclosure. Okay, um, I've known a few people to keep like ivory millipedes in with their uh, leopard geckos and isopods. Um, you know, it, it seems to me based on the conversations, I had a leopard gecko at one time, um, a long time ago, as well as a crested gecko. Um, and uh, I never kept them in bioactive setups though. Um, so I personally think that sometimes it depends on the animal a little bit. You may find that your particular gecko will um, feed on isopods and, you know, isopods of certain sizes, um, and it might depend a little bit on the size of your gecko. Um, but uh, I personally think that it probably doesn't matter too much what kind of isopods you put in there. Um, I would recommend, you know, that you just try something and see how it goes. If you see that they disappeared quickly or you observe your leopard gecko to feed on them rather immediately, that species is probably too large. And so you might want to go down to one of the dwarf species like the dwarf whites or the dwarf purples or the dwarf striped. Um, there are a lot of other dwarf species in the hobby now probably, um, but those are the only ones that I raise. Um, and, uh, you know, bi bioactive can also mean that there are, you know, like any, in, there's so many different kinds of pets you can put in there. And uh, it's, it's all about that relationship between your pet and the isopods, because if it's snacking on them, um, you, uh, you can still have a bioactive enclosure with like springtails and maybe some other organisms, maybe even the millipedes, um, which, you know, do secrete, uh, distasteful compounds that could be toxic. We don't know how toxic things are on an animal by animal basis on this planet. So um, always be careful if you love your pet, err on the side of caution. And uh, um, if the isopods are just disappearing because your pet is eating them, then um, you know, uh, your pet has decided whether it's going to be a bioactive setup with isopods or not. Um, have you ever had captive pill roaches? Okay, so there's, there's a cockroach called the pill bug roach. And I did have a culture of them. Um, I remember paying an arm and a leg for them. And I remember thinking that they were gonna do well for me like almost every other roach species I ever kept. But I think I only had them, be, had them for about four months six months maybe it's a long time ago and uh they they just kind of started disappearing um you know um it's hard to tell sometimes depending on what your setup is like how well something is doing you know you look in there and you see less and less every time you know and you try to tweak little variables but i started out with a very small group of them and um I, I never really figured out what it was that I was doing wrong. I don't remember whether it was too much moisture or not enough heat, um, too little moisture, don't really recall. But um, based on my experience with uh, so many different species of pet roaches, I would um, love to have the opportunity to try them again. And um, I would probably go to roachforum.com a website of mine, popular cockroach forum where people exchange information. And uh, it was also uh, co-moderated by Orrin McMonagall, who um, originally uh, the uh, forum was uh, set up under the name uh, All Pet Roaches. It still carries that title, um, but I helped him to revamp it at one time a long time ago when the original software wasn't working. Anyway, uh, tangent there. Uh, 
they adore them, but they can't seem to find the pill bug roaches in the pet trade here. Um, I don't know if they are still here in the United States in the U.S. hobby off the top of my head. Um, you know, even when things are here, they can be very difficult to find, as we all know. Tanner Wyndham, I absolutely love rhino roaches and was very excited to learn they were put into one of my favorite computer games, Planet Zoo. Not familiar with the game. My question is, what is the basic care for these roaches? Are they difficult to care for? Um, I find them to be extremely easy, unlike the pill bug roaches. Um, I probably only check on mine once every two weeks and at that time I crush in a little bit more leaf litter. Now I keep them on a very shallow substrate and that's something that I learned from Orrin McMonagall who has raised these through, I don't know, probably four or five generations now. Um, he, aside, um, aside ones that have been smuggled in by other people, um, the ones that I have right now are from him originally. Um, their, um, their ancestors were from him. Um, these, uh, he recommended a half inch of substrate. And so I've always kept them per his recommendations. Um, I think his reasoning through experience of raising them for the last 20 plus years is that, um, they will burrow, they love to burrow, but, um, Sometimes those burrows will collapse and maybe stress the female out or you can't see that she has uh, given birth and maybe the baby starved down there in the burrows. Um, I don't remember what the exact reasons were, but I can tell you that for the many years I've been keeping them, I've always kept them on a shallow substrate. Um, I feed them oak leaves and uh, more primarily uh, big leaf maple leaves, which they seem to love. I supplement them with roach or jelly cups, um, roach jelly cups or beetle jelly cups, they're kind of the same thing. Um, and then uh, I offer them fish food pellets, carrots, apple, and I occasionally, if I have, you know, like some cucumber or melon that I've cut up for some other things like millipedes, I will also offer them some of that, but uh, leaf litter seems to be the most important component in their diet and in their health um, as in our pet cages. So, um, and I, I run mine rather dry. I don't keep them on a particularly moist substrate. I do wet things down and they do love a good drink every two weeks, um, but they have extremely thick cuticles, these uh, exoskeleton on their body. They don't seem to lose a lot of water. Um, like some other roach species that will desiccate or dry out very quickly. And so um, the trick, of course, Tanner, is uh, acquiring specimens in the first place. And if you watched the video for the contest here, you can see, as can everybody else, that there may be some babies here in the Bugs in Cyberspace near future. Next question, Action Guy 95 on your bug catching trips, what were you the most excited to find? Well, um, I've been on quite a few trips and um, it's a really broad question, um, kind of like asking me what my favorite bug is. I'm always looking, um, it depends on who I'm with, really. That's probably the biggest factor in all of this. Um, the people you're with, they really, make a bug trip, which is going to be amazing anyway. They, 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 they can make it like uh, uh, so much more amazing. I, I was looking for a phrase, but I couldn't, couldn't pull it out of the air. Orders of magnitude, there it is. Um, orders of magnitude more amazing. Um, you see my group of guys that I tend to go on these trips with, and uh, some of them I've been going on trips with for uh, about a decade now. Uh, Jesse Green, who runs the shapesandnature.com business, donated this sticker. Um, he is a more recent uh, member of our trips, and uh, he hasn't been to these places with us before. And so through his eyes, uh, vicariously, when we take him on these trips, we are seeing 
all of these things that we've seen numerous times before, again, for the first time. And it's just a wonderful experience to be with people who, um, you know, it, it, it's sort of like recapturing our youth in a way and our first experiences seeing these amazing organisms. But what I especially like is when we all find, as we did on this last trip, a species that we've always wanted to see but had never seen before. And in that case, it was um, uh, oh, the species name is escaping me, but you guys wouldn't care probably anyway. Chalpo, Chalpo lepidus, I think, is how it's pronounced. Um, Chalco lepidus. Anyway, it's a metallic green click beetle, giant metallic green click beetle. And I think I uploaded that video um, where we found those specimens to YouTube already. I have some more Arizona footage that I'm going to be uploading um, here as we progress through winter and uh, partly so that I can reminisce about what it's like to be outside in the warm sunshine looking for bugs with uh, my really good friends. So. Um, most important thing, go on trips with people you like and who have similar interests. Um, spending a week with other people, and you know these from family trips, um, they can be a great source of stress if you're not all on the same page um, with everything. And so um, it's just so much fun to go on those trips, and I can't wait to go on the next one. We were talking about Florida last night, and uh, I'm ex excited to maybe do Florida in the summer of 2020, which is, 2020 is four days from now. Next question, Alida or Alida Alfonso. Hi, Peter, I was wondering if millipedes can live happily and healthily on their own, or if they are better suited to living with friends. I was also curious as to whether or not millipedes of different species are able to reproduce. So I can't think of any millipedes off of the top of my head that are capable of interbreeding with other millipedes that are designated as a different species. This is, this is sort of a complicated topic to discuss. I'll see what I can do with it here for you on the spot like this. Um, scientists will often um, uh, call a species something on the basis of a location. And so there may be in one part of the island of Madagascar a kind of hissing cockroach that they call Grampadorina portentosa. And then on another part of the island they will call another species Grampadorina oblonganoda. And um, in nature there are geographic boundaries between these two species so that they are two isolated populations that while they share a common ancestor they no longer have any overlap in they don't meet up with each other in the natural setting and so scientists will um, sometimes designate things as different species because they are geographically distinct species um, however, if you put those two species in captivity, they will interbreed. Um, I think there are other examples um, with animals uh, like, I, I always get this one mixed up, so it's, it's the horse, donkey, mule thing um, where, you know, two of them will breed and they will produce an offspring and um, that offspring uh, cannot then breed and produce more offspring because it's sort of like a genetic throwback. Um, they're, uh, they're infertile because the two parent animals are no longer close enough as species, I think, to produce viable offspring. Um, I believe that camels and um, llamas or maybe alpacas, some of those are able to uh, produce offspring um, lions and tigers, I don't know if their offspring can reproduce or not, but uh, it's called a liger. <laughs> Google it. It's an interesting looking animal. Anyway, um, so um, always ask the person that you're acquiring things from, or if they don't know the answer, feel free to contact me and ask on a species by species, case by case basis. 
I'll be happy to answer uh, those questions for you. Off of the top of my head, I can't think of any species in the pet millipede hobby that are capable of interbreeding um, and are also available. So, um, and then the first question was, uh, are millipedes uh, fine on their own or do they prefer company? Um, it, is, it is my distinct opinion that it is um, better for the animals to have tank mates. There are some exceptions to that rule if they are solitary animals in nature, like vinegaroons or lots of scorpions, um, lots of spiders, predatory animals. Um, they will cannibalize their tank mates in many cases. Uh, millipedes do fine together since uh, they are scavengers and, and herbivores, uh, detrivores, things like that. So you can keep them together. Um, different species are okay too. I don't know how much um, how much they will get from interacting with species not their own, but it certainly, and I always say this, I advocate the experience that you want to have. I think you will enjoy seeing a diversity of millipede species in your tank. It'll be a tank that's more interesting to watch, and you may make observations that I have not myself seen by keeping certain species together. Um, and watching them interact. Um, keeping multiples of one species together means that you could potentially see breeding behaviors, uh, courtship behaviors that you wouldn't otherwise see, um, and then you might be able to see the life cycle reproduce itself, you know, with the eggs and, and very small uh, millipedes, the babies, and watch them grow up. So um, I personally think it's more interesting to have more than one specimen in a tank because, and you know, the question is kind of loaded in the first place. When a keeper or a potential keeper asks me a question like that, I, I understand that they're asking it from a question of the human experience of solitude and loneliness. And so um, if you will be having an experience of, um, you know, sympathy or pity for your pet, that's not the experience you want to have. That's not the experience I want you to have. So get it a friend. Okay, Benjamin Gravot Gravetto. I've always wanted blue death fanning beetles. Who knows, I may get lucky. Benjamin, you gotta ask a question. That's the contest. Um, when you go out on a bug slash herping adventure, um, for those of you who are just bug keepers, herping is a reference to um, reptile uh, collectors or enthusiasts. Uh, they often lump uh, uh, amphibians in with that too. Um, and, uh, and a lot of people uh, lump bugs in with that group as well. And uh, I don't get picky about terminology and words. Um, I've been doing this way too long. I went through my days of arguing with people about things. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes being right, sometimes being wrong. I just don't care anymore. Um, you know, it's I'm, like I said before, I'm just, I'm just here to um, exchange ideas with people and to find a common language. And so that's always my goal. Um, when I go out, what are some must-haves as far as tools or equipment that you bring to make your search easier or safer? Okay, this is a good question. I was recently doing a live stream on Instagram um, a few months ago. I, I had gone out to a somewhat local park and I was hiking through. I hadn't been to this park uh, more than a time or two. Um, I'd, I'd been to it years ago, but it's a very large urban park here in the Portland area. And um, I was live streaming and not really paying attention to my battery power. And um, in the middle of the live stream, my battery died. I had been out there hiking around for maybe an hour doing the live stream, answering people's questions in this same way that we are doing this contest. And I got lost. Um, so <laughs> my first thing is you have some kind of GPS device or a phone where you have a connection, where you can um, look at a map and uh, pay attention to your battery power. That's my most recent learning experience in this regard. Um, I also like to take um, a headlamp with me wherever I go. Um, I, uh, 
I often want to be wherever I'm at looking for, uh, uh, you know, adventures in the dark with these animals because it's a different suite of animals than what you see during the day. Uh, and so that's another really important thing. Um, take a friend, uh, you know, don't go alone. That's another big tip. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as uh, equipment, it entirely depends on what your goals are. Um, you know, most of it's just common sense stuff like water and, you know, some warm clothes. I mean, you just never know when you're going to get lost, especially if you're in a new area. Um, and especially if you are even half as excited about being there as I am, because, you know, like you just like one bug leads to the another <laughs> and you just lose your mind. And before you know it, you're like, you look up all of a sudden and, um, you know, uh, you don't know where you are. Uh, the sun is going down um, as it was when I was at the park. I actually learned that I could jog again <laughs> and uh, uh, eventually found my car. But anyway, um, the, the point of your uh, excursion will dictate the equipment that is needed for it. And so I would need to look, know a little bit more about what you were doing out there to answer this question with more accuracy. Um, care, K-H-A-Y-R. When you go out on a bug, oh, that, that's the one I just read. I didn't read your name the first time. Puppy Mint Mocha. That's, that's a name I'm always going to remember. Uh, this person has asked questions in the last few contests. And um, PMM, I'm just going to, I'm going to remember it forever. It's just a catchy name. What type of arthropod do you find to have the most fascinating or bizarre life cycle? Ooh, that's a really, really tricky one. Um, I don't pay a lot of attention to bizarre life cycles. Um, I have come into contact with um, lots of really interesting stories. Uh, there's a whole bunch of weird things that happen with aphids, for example, and how they reproduce. Um, you know, uh, the life cycle of a butterfly or a moth with that whole process of metamorphosis. Like what happens to make this caterpillar, um, which is basically a big sack of goo, uh, form this sarcophagus like you can actually see the face of the developing moth on the surface of the pupa within the cocoon. Um, same thing with uh, flies and wasps and things like that. Well, I mean, not flies, I guess, but um, it looks more like the larva. But anyway, um, and then, and then some, somehow, you know, that, that all of those tissues break down and like a butterfly comes out of that. Get out of here. It's crazy. Um, fascinating. Uh, sil silver universe. A lot of people have said that these are quite common, but I'd like to ask you this. How often is it that you run across a house centipede, and what was your favorite reaction upon doing so? I do remember house centipedes when I was younger. Um, growing up here in Portland, I would see them in the basements sometimes, and at that time, um, I don't think... I see someone walking their dog out. Um, at that time, I don't think that um, I looked at them and thought they were cuddly. We'll just say that. Uh, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I found them um, creepy, but I did find them fast, and I did find it a little disturbing that when I tried to capture one, um, uh, the legs would often fall off because that's something that they do and the legs would twitch a little bit there on the ground um, because what happens is those twitching legs will distract the predator of the animal and uh, the animal will be able to escape while the predator is like, oh, I got this leg and it's moving and you know, you know that thing. So um, the other part of the question was, uh, okay, so I, I can't remember, actually I can't, I can't remember the last time I saw a house centipede in a house, but I can drive a couple hours east of here out towards the Columbia River Gorge and flip rocks and find lots of house centipedes. Um, uh, the common house centipede is actually from Europe. It's uh, Scutigera 
uh, Coleoptrata, that's its species name, and uh, they are not native to the United States. We do have, I think, just one species of house centipede in that uh, genus, uh, Scuta, not the genus, it's the uh, family, Scuta germorpha. And, uh, oh, no, it's the order. It's the order, Scuta Um Anyway, I've found them in Arizona. I think it's like Dendra something or other, Dendra Homa. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But um, I find them to be much more attractive. Um, they look very similar. They're only slightly smaller. And uh, they're a beautiful orange coloring with some markings on them. And it's one of my goals um, in life <laughs> to acquire a few more specimens of them and to captive breed them. Um, I think that would be a very interesting thing to do. Um, moving on. Fangs and forests. I remember seeing somewhere that death fanging beetles can successfully cohabitate with desert scorpions. These beetles help clean up leftover insect parts that the scorpion doesn't eat, and the scorpion doesn't harm the beetles. Does this relationship actually work? I have never personally tried it. From what I've heard, it does work. Uh, people regularly buy both a desert hairy scorpion and a small group of blue death feigning beetles and do report back to me that everything is, is going well so far. Um, I have actually never heard once back from a person who said that their desert hairy scorpion um, killed a blue death feigning beetle. Um, I greatly suspect that the thickness of the cuticle on the blue death feigning beetles protects them from both stings and pinches mouth parts of the scorpions. Uh, I don't, I think they are impervious to damage from the scorpions and um, so. Uh, I, I can't say with certainty that uh, other U.S. scorpion species could be kept communally with the blue death feigning beetles. I haven't heard a lot of information back on that, even though people ask me about it all the time and, you know, say they might do it and never hear back. So, not really sure. A smaller stinger could maybe perhaps work its way in between, um, you know, the head and the thorax, you know, one of the overlapping plates or segments. I don't know. Um, kind of doubt it though. I mean, uh, yeah. And if so, how does the scorpion differentiate between the beetles and the insects it eats? Um, I can't honestly answer that question. I might guess over time that uh, the scorpion, um, if it doesn't naturally know the difference from a distance, that it may pinch the beetles and try to do something with them initially, but over time leave them alone. I just don't have any data on that from hearing back from people. Um, certainly a hungry scorpion will dispatch a cricket um, rather immediately. So um, if it were to grab a beetle and uh, couldn't do anything about it, it would likely just drop it and um, move on. Uh, Emily says, have you raised any insects that you found in your own backyard or neighborhood? If so, which is your favorite? I often find Arizona mantises and angle-winged katydids in my yard, which have made great pets. Um, yes, um, all the time, all the time. Uh, from uh, when I was young and, uh, and still, and it's something that I will do for the rest of my life. Um, one of the things that I have collected most recently, and I have a nice little starter colony of them, and I have reproduced them in captivity before. Um, they are a tiny little species of springtail. Um, they're actually a big springtail. <laughs> Springtails are small, small animals, but um, uh, these particular ones are blue and they're kind of spiky looking. Um, and if you look at the back of a blue death feigning beetle close up, it would look very much like one of these springtails does in terms of both the coloration and the sort of bumpy texture. And so um, I'm not necessarily raising them because I plan on uh, selling them. Um, I'm just raising them because uh, I raise other springtails and 
Um, I'm just curious about them. I have uh, uploaded video in the past of the eggs that they deposited and those eggs hatching and little pale lavender larvae or immatures, um, um, you know, moving around in the tank with the adults. It's a nice contrast in colors between the blue adults and the purple offspring. Really pretty. Um, so we'll see, we'll see where that goes. So yeah, I do. I do that sort of thing all the time. Um, Robert Gear, beautiful stickers in Death Feigning Beetles area. Great first prize as well, first pet insect. Just leaving a comment. Thank you, Robert. And Dry Bones 7. What's your opinion on bug fight videos like Monster Bug Wars? This is this is a really good question. Um, I, I'm always hesitant when I'm spontaneously answering questions like this to say too much too quickly. Um, you know, I don't like to be critical or negative of what other people find entertaining. Um, um, you know, there, there could be art, you know, that some people say, this is art. The creator says, this is art. Someone else says, I see the art. Someone else says, uh, that's garbage, you know, whatever. Um, for me personally, the Monster Bug Wars, um, um, I'm 45 years old. Uh, I've had a particular upbringing that does lend itself to being curious about what happens when one bug meets another bug, when one animal meets another animal, when a car crashes on uh, the side of the highway into another car, you know, like everybody else is slowing down and looking to see what's going on. Is there really something interesting there to see? Um, I don't think that it's necessarily something to be ashamed of, to be curious about these train wrecks that uh, we encounter in life. Um, but I also think that it's uh, something that you should reflect upon for yourself. Like I said earlier, you do you boo. Decide what's, um, you know, decide what you think is right and what you think is wrong. Um, I'm not super familiar with that particular show. I think it's, I don't know if it was on television. I don't watch television um, um, or movies for that matter. So I'm not always familiar with what is, uh, you know, if it's just a YouTube show or if these are clips on YouTube. I've seen a couple of them or parts of a couple of them. Um, I will say that um, I recall finding some of the encounters between one animal, one insect, for example, and one other insect or a scorpion and a centipede or whatever they are, to be completely implausible um, in the sense that these two animals would never meet in nature. Um, you know, I mean, to say never is, is a bit far-fetched, I suppose, but um, to put these two animals in a cage together for the sole purpose of entertaining people as one and the, and the other, they battle to the death and one kills the other. Um, I don't know if they play it through completely on that particular show because there's a lot of shows that are very similar to this. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an advocate of that kind of behavior. Um, I do find it to be a bit negative and um, sensational. I guess. Um, but then again, um, you know, it's, it's not my personal choice to judge other people um, in what they want to create and what they find entertaining. Um, it's entirely legal for them to do what they're doing, of course. And so that pretty much sums up my feelings on the whole thing. And uh, I have learned over the years that um, it's just best to, uh, when you have nothing else to say on a topic, to shut up. <laughs> so, Pet Rexter. Pet Rexter. What is the strangest food that you have fed your isopods and they loved? Um, I've, uh, I've seen a lot of videos on YouTube where people feed uh, weird things to their pets. Um, Isopods are detrivores, um, scavengers, excuse me, 
Um, uh, in rare cases, they will prey on something that is molting, still living, um, sometimes on each other. So, uh, you know, that, that, that could potentially qualify as a strange food. Um, I'm, I'm not one to really experiment by putting strange things in tanks. Um, I have a lot of tanks. I've had a lot of tanks for a very long time. I pretty much offer everything, pretty standard offerings that I've, you know, been, been using for a long time. I offer them a lot of leaves, <laughs> primarily. And bits of carrot and apple and fish food pellets and uh, in some cases the little jelly cups. So that pretty much sums up what I feed them. I don't have a good example for something strange that I have fed to them that I can recall. Um, I have at times in the past when um, a roach dies, for example, I will often throw it in the tank with my blue death painting beetles because they're desert bugs. They scavenge the remains of things that die in the desert because, you know, meals are few and far between. Um, the isopods in a colony will take advantage and feed on most any organic material that you put into the container. Um, I just haven't, um, I can't answer this question in a more interesting way than I already have because I haven't experimented, <laughs> sorry. Angela Jones, you've been a regular uh, commenter and I appreciate your time in commenting. She says, I'm going to be ordering one or two spiny flower mantises from you soon, and I'm trying to figure out the lighting and heating requirements of any. My comfort zone is 73 degrees year round. My thermostat right now is set at 68 degrees. That's me. I see it on the wall over there. Uh, my bug room is a little warmer, but uh, often uh, it's hovering around 73 degrees. Now that's not an optimal temperature as you go on to say here. I've learned so far is that the spiny flower mantises prefer temps in 75 to 80 degrees. Um, and uh, then she talks about lighting and windows. Uh, real quick, I will say that um, I have had people over the years contact me and say, um, I got my mantises five hours ago. They were just fine. And now uh, it or they are dying. And I said, well, can you take me take a picture for me? And then they take a picture for me and there's this window and they're in the windowsill. And what has happened is that the sun has shined in through the window and the heat has built up in the container uh, to degrees that are hot enough to unfortunately and sadly kill the specimens. And so um, you say your windows are north facing. Um, I would just recommend that you are very careful, careful about putting mantises in windows themselves, regardless of what direction you believe your window is facing exactly. So be careful with that. Um, and you're correct, like 75 degrees is probably a good minimum temperature for optimally raising a mantis. Now, a mantis can get down to almost freezing temperatures for short periods of time. They're fine in the 40s, they're fine in the 50s, they're fine in the 60s, they're not going to die because they got cold at those temperatures. Sub-freezing, bad, below 32 degrees, 32 degrees or below, ice will freeze, no, water will freeze into ice. And um, mantises and other bugs will often freeze in many cases, not woolly bear caterpillars though. They have antifreeze, as do lots of other things, um, or an equivalent, a biological equivalent of antifreeze. Um, uh, so anyway, um, it is recommended that you keep them a little bit warmer. Um, it is recommended that you figure out your lighting and heating requirements. They're not so dependent on light. Um, the, the windows of your home will provide suitable light for them. Um, you know, regardless of how far they are and further is better than close in the sense of airing them at the side of caution again. But, um, you know, if you can keep them a little warmer, do that. If you have a warmer part of your house, do that. Um, I have a jar of honey in a cupboard over here that I keep right up against the wall. Um, it's a wooden panel and right on the other side of that wooden panel is my refrigerator. And because my refrigerator uh, through the process of staying cold generates heat outside of the refrigerator, that honey pot right next to it um, 
the, the honey stays liquid instead of during the colder times of the year uh, solidifying. And so you may be able to find some warmer spots of your house. You may get a thermometer and kind of test some different areas to find a place that will work. Um, you can uh, artificially light, you know, use light bulbs, heat lamps. Uh, some people use heat pads. Those are things you want to be careful about. I would want to discuss your containers and your particular setup that you're going to have. I don't want to recommend a particular heat fixture or element to you without knowing what the cage you're going to be using looks like because these things can often do more harm to your mantises than, uh, you know, room temperature or, you know, uh, temperatures in the 60s can. So, we always have to, I always have to be very careful and not giving you a blanket answer to a complicated problem. Um, Robert Gear. Oh, Robert, I think I mentioned you a moment ago. You had commented, and now here's a question from you. Now, what has been the most challenging insect you have ever got to breed? Um, a, a really broad question again. Um, I've worked with so many things over the years. I just mentioned those little springtails a moment ago. It wasn't a challenge, but it was a challenge in the sense that I don't know anybody else on the planet who has ever done it before. Um, and so there, you know, it's, it, I was a pioneer. I had that, that, that feeling of being a pioneer. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the mystery of not having any information, but just trying to reproduce the conditions that I see them in the outside, not necessarily knowing what they eat, maybe doing a minimal amount of research online to find out what I can about them, but mostly winging it. Um, uh, you saw the video yesterday of the rhino roaches. I've had them for eight years, uh, that those, those two, um, or they're eight years old, I should say. I told the story about how long I've had them. Um, you know, that's, they only reproduce once a year. Um, and so uh, that's a challenge and I've managed to reproduce them before. Um, so, I mean, so many things are challenging. It's, it's, it's always a challenge when you start out with low numbers of something because then you're, uh, and you may not know whether you have males or females. And so then you're, you know, you're raising these things up and then they mature and maybe you have two females and one male. And if it's mantises, you know, you introduce a male very carefully to a female and she eats him or, you know, he breeds with the first one and then you introduce him to the second one and she eats him. So, um, you know, Every challenge is a new challenge. Every species you want to keep optimally. You want to do your best by the species, by your pet, if you want to call it a pet. And, uh, you know, challenge yourself to provide the best care that you can for it. Thank you for your question, Robert. Another Robert, Robert Lamb. Um, I always appreciate seeing comments from you, Robert, too, because I know you have a lot of experience in the hobby. And um, you ask here, why are velvet worms so hard to get a hold of in the hobby despite the seemingly large interest in them? Um, there really isn't a correlation uh, between interest and, avail and availability. Um, with so many things, and I mean, these, these are just in that category of things. Um, one of the reasons why um, there is interest in them is because there was a species uh, over the course of the last 15 years or so from New Zealand that was occasionally imported um, through reptile channels mainly, and um, they fared uh, very poorly in captivity and um, but because they were in the hobby off and on during all of these years and because they are such a um, odd animal that does get some um, mention in nature documentaries when they're discussing arthropods and their allies um, uh, uh, lost my train of thought there a little bit, but um, basically uh, there is a new species in the hobby and that is the Epiperipetus barbadensis that I showcased in a recent video. And 
Um, those ones are third generation captive bred and uh, they've been circulating around the hobby a little bit. A handful of people have breeding groups of them. And um, because, because there's just a little bit of more awareness about them because of that, because people have them, um, they're starting to get noticed again. And uh, only time will tell to see if, uh, if they're going to be more common in the hobby, but I don't think they reproduce commonly enough, or I mean often enough, um, or uh, produce uh, in large numbers to where they're ever going to be very common. And so they're probably always going to be sort of one of those fringe things, uh, like the rhino roaches, for example, where everybody wants them. Um, and, uh, you know, if I were to keep a waiting list of uh, people who had asked me for rhino roaches, um, and it's a game I always play when somebody emails me about them or orchid mantises or something else that's highly desirable, I say, um, and they say, can you put me on your waiting list? I say, I'm sorry, I, I can't put you on a waiting list. I don't keep a waiting list. If I did, you would be number 3072. It's always the number I use. Maybe you guys have seen it before, some of you. You would be number 3072 on it. And um, your chances are much improved by the fact that I don't keep a waiting list because your number would never get called. And so I, um, when I have something available, um, I will be taking pictures of it and posting it on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. Um, your chances are much improved by watching my social media accounts of being one of the first come, first serve to acquire something. And in those cases, I will generally list it up on the website. It's a free for all. And, you know, I'm not playing favorites. The person who's been a customer of mine for 20 years has just a, as good a chance as the person who randomly stumbles in off of the Google search engine to my website. And it's just fair like that. And uh, that's how I do it. Um, and then Robert went on, Robert Lamb also went on to say, also just going to say you're awesome for doing all these giveaways. I do really enjoy them, Robert. And I think you can probably see that through the time I put into answering these questions. I don't know if anybody wants to hear me say all of these things, but you, um, and to, to go on and on about them. But um, I do what I enjoy doing, and I do enjoy this very much. Danny Boy asks, what different species of bugs can be housed together? In effect, millipedes housed with roaches or isopods housed with literally anything. Not literally, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and it made the little sideways laughing, crying face. Okay, um, you know, all of those things can be kept together. You can do in your tank whatever you want to do. It has been my experience that millipedes and roaches and isopods can all live together in the same tank. So um, the question out there is, you know, which isopods and roaches might feed on the millipede eggs. It depends on what your goal with the tank is. If you're trying to breed lots of millipedes, don't probably keep the isopods and the roaches in with them. Um, you know, if, if you want to produce lots of millipedes, if you just want a cool tank that has a lot of things in it, you know, go, go ahead and put small numbers of these things together and, um, you know, uh, experiment a little bit. That's half the fun in our hobby is, you know, offering a new food, um, you know, eating dinner and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe one of your kids or maybe you're the kid, <laughs> um, you, you didn't finish your broccoli or whatever. And, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, there's a little bit of stock, you know, that, uh, you know, your mother threw in the trash or whatever, just fish it out, you know, cut it up into little pieces, put it in with your, uh, put it in with your isopods and see if it's a food they like. I will tell you though, that after a few days, broccoli really stinks. So <laughs> be advised on that. Um, so, you know, like so many different species of things can be housed together if they are not predatory or aggressive towards each other in one fashion or another. And there aren't so many of them that one is going to um, outcompete the other in terms of resources causing the other one to starve. So, um, 
really, those are the kinds of questions I may or may not be able to answer on a case-by-case -case basis with specific species being mentioned. Um, Daniel Rhodes, what insects have you always wanted to keep but have never been able to get your hands on? I mean, that's, that's, that's like an iceberg question, you know, like there, there's so much more that I haven't seen down there below the surface. There are things that I have not only seen, but they have not even come into my existence. There are 10 to 100 million organ, uh, insects on the planet. And, uh, you know, nobody even knows how many there are. They keep revising what the number is. It's probably around 10 million, but um, so many of them have not even been named by science or seen by human eyes. New things are being discovered all the time. Um, and so, um, Archiblata hevenae, hevenae how it's spelled. Um, that's a, a roach species that I don't think I've ever kept that I would love to get my hands on right now. Jen Roberts, my question is about blue death feeding beetles. How is your breeding with them going? Any updates? Um, I do have an update for you because you asked. It's not information that I would necessarily volunteer because I'm failing miserably. <laughs> Um, I have so many things going on all the time, I haven't devoted the attention to it. I realize I made a video or two sort of teasing you guys with the project I was working on um, and inspired again by Russ over at Aquarimax, a fine YouTube channel here on YouTube. Um, YouTube, YouTube. Um, I uh, tried doing something different than what other people did. I individually pulled the eggs that I found in the tank. Eggs are rather common. I have a lot of blue death banding beetles at any given moment. And so I was pulling the eggs out and trying to incubate them. I tried keeping them moist and warm. I tried keeping them dry and warm. I have tried mixing up the variables in lots of ways, but inevitably in each case, the eggs have after two to three days, either desiccated into nothingness, like a little raisin, or they have rotted or even molded in some cases. And so it's really interesting to me that I have not gotten past that point, although I only tried it in the um, time frame just surrounding my uploads of those videos a month or two ago. And so um, I would say that um, it's something that I'm still interested in doing and that uh, I uh, will be digging around in my tank to look for some larvae from eggs that I didn't pull out um, at some point soon. But um, there, I mean, I already have taken so many videos of things that I have not uploaded to my YouTube channel because it's always a little bit of a game in not, um, you know, burying you guys with all of the content that I have ready to throw at you. Um, sort of, you know, only doing a few videos per week. Um, and then right now I'm on this contest trip because your responsiveness to this kind of YouTube video has been much greater. And so that's what I'm doing now. But I'll come back to that, Jen. And that was, that was a fair question. And I appreciate your attention um, to those prior videos and your curiosity about where things are going. I wonder if you are one of the people who is having more success than me because I do routinely get um, on Instagram in particular. And Jen Roberts, I recognize your name as well as I recognize anybody else's name on here as a person who's been a customer of mine on a very regular basis. I think I even know what state you live on off the top of my head here. Um, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll come back, to, I'll come back to the Blue Death Fainting Beetles and we'll do some reproduction things and uh, I'll continue to let you know if uh, I see some other great uh, channels on YouTube where people are working on that. Um, but yeah, people are sending me images of their larvae getting bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. So um, it's, it's, hobbyists are making progress on captive breeding these. Joseph Austin, what are some good tips on taking care of an orchid mantis? I don't have one yet, but I've been looking into it. Um, I have a mantis care sheet on my website, and I'll put a card up here for that. 
so that you can click on that and read about it. Uh, their care, aside from breeding, which is a little bit trickier because the males are so small in comparison to the females, their care is the same as it is for all other mantises. Um, a minimum of 75 degrees is recommended for uh, the, the uh, mantis to metabolize, digest its food in a proper way. 80 degrees would be better. Um, and feeding suitable uh, sized prey uh, is important. Humidity is important. Good climbing structures for them to hang from and molt off are important. Other than that, they're just like and because of that, uh, they're just like every other mantis species in the hobby in terms of their care. Rather easy. Smocklers. Smoklers? Not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Love your videos. Other than the various Chrysina beetles, those are the jewel scarabs, the beautiful green ones. There's four species in the United States. What are some other green colored beetles in the pet trade that can be kept in the U.S.? Green beetles. Well, harlequin beetles, a uh, flower scarab that I offer through the website, they're greenish if they're not um, out in the open air for very long. Uh, if they're out in the open air, they turn to a bright yellow color, really beautiful. Um, the green caterpillar hunter, uh, Callosoma scrutator, is a very common uh, and a large green ground beetle that can live a few years as a pet. Um, feeding on uh, mealworms or uh, crickets, things like that. Um, there's a little bit of a trick to getting them to feed. Um, sometimes if the prey is not small enough or soft bodied enough, there are caterpillar, they are caterpillar hunters after all. Um, they're called that because they, um, they, they will feed on uh, like many different things, but soft bodied prey are uh, what their mouth parts are uh, best designed for. Um, green is my favorite color, and it just makes me sad that I can't raise some of the Mechinorhina or even Phallocrum Mathis Mulleri rainbow stag beetles is what that last one is. And the other one is an African, I think, scarab, a uh, big flower beetle from Africa. Um, hope you have a great new year. Uh, happy new year to everybody here, uh, you included, Smocklers. Thank you for the question. Sean Walsh, I have several excellent climbing species, especially nymphs, such as Uricotus improcera. Um, I've not heard of that specific species within the roach genus Uricotus, but I'm familiar with the genus. Um, how do you keep them contained, or is it a losing battle? I use a silicone grease at the rim, plus a gasket tub, but they are sneaky little buggers. Okay, um, just for fun, I'm going to take you guys on a little field trip here. I'm not going to show you my whole house cover up the camera here um, as I walk, but I'm going to go downstairs to show you a couple of examples of what I use to keep the roaches contained. Get a few things out here. All right, so here is one, and in this cage I have centurions. This is a really simple setup. I basically just have pinched here between the lid and the container bottom a sheet of paper towel, and that keeps the roaches in. Often you'll see a few that have managed to crawl in from between those two sheets of paper towel and they'll in, be in between the lid, but they can't squeeze out because, you know, these aren't airtight containers, but you, um, you can see that uh, that little bit of paper towel, it seals off that little bit of airspace in there. And then another thing that I use is the good old five gallon bucket. And uh, you can see here that this one's getting a little bit frayed up on top here. Um, I, I uh, drilled holes in and then I covered it with paper towel and then taped that down so fungus gnats wouldn't get inside of this and uh, these things are a little cumbersome to open with one hand. Let me uh, down here for just a second. Show you what I've got going on inside here. Um, 
currently in this con in this bucket I have uh, Turkestan roach culture, and uh, you may find it interesting to see that I have sand down there. And uh, anyway, that's that's what I do. This isn't a very uh, a very adept species when it comes to climbing. Um, I have at times in the past had a Vaseline barrier when I've had climbing species in buckets like this. Um, and that will mean that uh, on the lid here, uh, when I open it, there won't be as many up there, um, if any at all. Um, and you know, uh, this is what most people would consider a feeder roach. A lot of people keep feeder roaches. Um, probably more feeder roaches are kept than pet roaches. And so I might tap on the lid of this container a little bit um, to knock them down because with certain fast and uh, climbing species, they would run out very quickly or be waiting on the lid in the little recesses right there. Um, but I don't have to worry about it with this species here. So those are a couple of the things that I do to keep my roaches contained. Um, those are really my two main techniques for keeping things in. And so pop back upstairs here and Continue on with the video. All right, that's about where we were. I did show you guys this back here. A cool, cool Goliath beetle shirt. Someone said Mechinorina a moment ago. This is uh, Goliathus orientalis on the back of my shirt here. Next question. Field trip, yay. Estella de Grande. Hey, my question is, have you ever successfully kept pseudoscorpions in captivity? If so, what was your experience keeping them and which species? Also, have you ever kept the Goliath stick insect or the Titan stick insect? Here we go. Okay, a couple different questions. Um, pseudoscorpions, um, if anybody out there wants a millions of dollars business idea, uh, mass-produce pseudoscorpions. I can't tell you how many people in the beekeeping hobby uh, contact me every year asking if I have pseudoscorpions available because they want them, they want to release them into their, uh, their, bee co their honeybee colonies to take down the varroa mites, I guess, and maybe some other little uh, pests that they have inside their uh, bee colonies. I've never kept honeybees before, so. I don't know too much about that, but um, lots and lots of requests from people. Um, and uh, so if, if you could ever uh, get in on that market, you would be a very, very rich person. <laughs> um, I have never personally reproduced the pseudoscorpions. I do sell a book about it through the website uh, that my good friend Oren McMonagall wrote. Um, he did it for many years, and I used to purchase them from him and resell them. But at one point, we oversold his culture of them, and uh, he was never able to recover it. Um, and they aren't huge reproducers. It was always for him a, a challenge, a labor of love, like many things that he has done over the years, like um, producing the Invertebrates magazine that I will probably give out in the next comment, uh, contest. Um, so, uh, you know, it can be done, uh, they would feed on mites, uh, which, um, beetle keepers like ourselves tend to have some mites around at all times. Um, anybody with a, a container with dirt in it, millipedes, isopods, things like that, you'll see mites in your containers off and on. Anyway, those make good foods for pseudoscorpions. Um, and the second part of this question was, have you ever kept the Goliath stick insect, which is Eurachnema goliath, or the Titan stick insect, which is Acrophylla titan? I think they are both Australian species, that's correct, but I'm not sure of the legality of keeping them in the U.S. Um, I, I talk about my phasmid days of long ago pretty frequently. Um, I did used to keep all of them. I presently have none. I don't expect to ever have any again because they do require permits to keep. They are regulated by the Department of Agriculture like many other plant eaters. Um, 
I know a museum recently who contacted me and they said that they uh, recently, uh, the Department of Agriculture told them that they uh, had to get rid of their stick insects. I'm not sure why I didn't ask, but um, they are something that are that is very highly regulated. Um, and uh, so you cannot keep them unless you go through the proper channels and apply for permits um, to keep them. And I have known a number of uh, private hobbyists to um, go through the, the process and they are legally allowed to keep them. And uh, there are special containment procedures and whatnot uh, that you have to satisfy in order to be able to keep them. Um, so I guess that answers that question. Where's my mouse? I think I'm gonna call it a roach from now on. It's kind of roach shaped and why should my mouse get all the love? Uh, someone says, make a video about your therophosony. Um, I, I'm tempted to say that they misspelled the word therophosony. I wonder if they even meant to say it. This is uh, Yi Chen Gao, and I think I know who you are. I, I, think, I think I know your name. It starts with a J. <laughs> um, and maybe that's your Chinese name. Um, anyway, uh, so Therophosony is a subfamily within the uh, tarantula uh, family, which is Therophosidae. And so there, are, there is a subset of tarantulas, like uh, Avicularia, they're in the subfamily Avicularia knee, and then Therophosa knee includes uh, tarantulas uh, like uh, uh, Brachypelma, I want to say Smithy, but it's, they, they reclassified it as Brachypelma hamorii, um, or hamori. I think it's hamorii, two eyes at the end. Anyway, um, I'll try to uh, do a quick little video about uh, Brachypelma hamorii uh, in a little while here because I do actually have uh, one downstairs that I can make a video with. Um, next question, Hawkeye Jones, do you have any bug or business goals for 2020? Um, I'm definitely a, a personality type that uh, likes the turning, the changing of the year. Um, that whole uh, um, that whole process of setting goals and you know reflecting back on on the prior year and setting new goals for what you want to do better. Um, bug goals. Uh, I can say that I want to make more trips this year. They don't have to be um, you know to far off places. Um, I did a video recently uh, about a trip that we took, I think back in October to Catherine Creek here, just an hour and a half outside of Portland. And uh, I went with a few other uh, bug people and really enjoyed just making the video about that trip from uh, going through downtown Portland, giving you guys a little bit of a, a shot of what the cityscape looks like, um, going through the Columbia Gorge, River Gorge there along the Columbia River, the actual location that we hiked at, the bugs there, the scenery, um, the people I was with. Um, that's a direction that I want to take this YouTube channel. Um, right now, I'm uh, trying to build my relationship with my subscribers here and gain new subscribers but that's really where I want to take this channel and uh, I appreciate the question um, and I hope that that's a direction that you guys are going to enjoy. Um, I have a lot of material through the course of the businesses that I run on a regular basis, uh, things that you can't see anywhere else and combinations of things that you can't see anywhere else. And um, so that gives me a little bit of an edge in terms of what I can present to you. But for me, I want this, I'm investing this time in YouTube and in you guys with hopes that I can myself go places and take you with me that I haven't been before. And uh, that's what this is all about for me. Give you a heads up there. A fine question, Hawkeye Jones. Next question, do you breed any of the bugs that you sell? By KB Lerner is her name. Um, 
think it's a female. Uh, I breed lots of bugs. Um, uh, almost every roach that I sell is one that I've bred. Um, I also breed mantises. I breed spiders in some cases. Uh, millipedes in some cases. Um, I don't breed scorpions. Uh, I rely on others to entirely supply me for those. I do not intentionally ever breed centipedes, you know, where I put a male and a female together. Um, occasionally a centipede will produce uh, plings, they call them little um, centipedlings. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's, so it, it's, it's really just a case by case basis. Yes, I breed a lot of things. Um, I do often uh, find myself uh, with more things, like I have a bunch of mantises right now that I want to breed, but I've been uh, pumping my extra time into YouTube lately rather than focusing on breeding my mantises. And so um, I've mentioned before that I just work around the clock all seven days of the week. And so I'm constantly making decisions about what I want to put time into. Um, so. Sandra Volsi says, what do you recommend for communal desert scorpion setups? Um, communal desert scorpion setups, that could mean the blue death fainting beetles with the uh, desert hairy scorpion. That's an example of a communal. Um, and uh, a large tank is always recommended. Um, obviously these animals live in nature typically and uh, the Sonoran Desert, for example, is a very large tank. The planet that we live on is a very large tank. <laughs> and so, um, you know, a 10 gallon cage would be a minimum, I would say, for setting up a communal uh, for a desert hairy and blue death fainting beetles. You can do it in a smaller tank. Um, it's tricky to answer questions like this because your desert hairy might be a young specimen or it could be a large specimen. And so that might dictate the tank size. Um, we, I can split hairs like this all day long with you. Uh, another uh, way that you might have meant a communal desert scorpion setup was that, you know, can you put a bunch of desert hairies in a container together or striped tail sor scorpions? Um, and uh, those don't do well together, so you can't. But there are communal species. I know someone who's keeping a lot of uh, uh, Phaejovis Carolinanus in a uh, setup together, and they seem to be doing well. Um, I wasn't sure if they were communal or not, but uh, they seem to be doing well with them. Um, Centroides vitatus, uh, vitatus, uh, the southern striped scorpion um, from Texas. Uh, those ones, they're bark scorpions, but they are highly communal. You can keep 30 of them in a cup this size and they're not going to bother each other. Um, don't do that, but, um, what is it? 10 o'clock and I'm still drinking coffee. That's crazy. Um, I'm not going to hit refresh here. I think I have one more unanswered question at this point, And I think I've been going for about an hour and 45 minutes. I'm probably not moving through this as quickly as I should, but, um, I enjoy it. This is my Saturday. This is my Friday night. Not get ahead of ourselves. Shane Carter asks, I'd like to know more about large aquatic predators like water scorpions, water abetus, a giant water bug or a ferocious water bug, if you will, and fishing spiders. I teach kids about macroinvertebrates in nearby Vancouver, Washington, and we sometimes see them. Shane, I wonder if you're the person that works at the, uh, I don't know if it's a wildlife refuge or, or what, but I think maybe you purchased some specimens for me for your exhibits recently. Um, you want to know about large aquatic predators. I mean, I don't know what all to tell you about them. I have in the state of Washington uh, seen water scorpions in the past. In 2009, I went up to a bug guide event. I think it was called the Pack Forest. Um, about three hours, two or three hours north of Vancouver, Washington, where you say you are. And um, while we were there uh, gathering uh, pictures and uh, data on the uh, 
it was a bug guide event. If you guys don't know what bug guide is, bugguide.net is my favorite website. Um, they basically people like myself, I've uploaded uh, lots and lots of images of bugs there and real experts will come along and identify the specimens that you upload. I have learned more from that website than from every other book I've read on entomology combined. Um, iNaturalist is a new one. Uh, there's an app for it, which is highly handy. I've only recently learned uh, about iNaturalist and begun to use it. But um, yearly, the Bug Guide website, they will um, a volunteer will host an event in a different part of the country each year and um, bug guiders like myself will show up and um, it's kind of like a bio blitz. We will photograph everything during the day or two of the event that we see, upload the images to bug guide and we will basically showcase or represent as many of the species of arthropods that we can find in the area during the event. Um, and so getting back to your question about the water scorpion, at that event, um, uh, I think I was talking to Lynette Schwimming and uh, a couple other people. She's a big bug guider, um, local spider lady, Pacific Northwest spider lady. I think she's up at the Burke Museum there in Seattle. Um, anyway, we were all talking about water scorpions and about how they look like stick insects and they're about this long and uh, they're, uh, they're actually hemipterans, they're in the true bug uh, order. But anyway, while we were talking about this fantastic animal, uh, my ex-wife uh, had wandered over to the edge of the pond and she goes, are you guys talking about one of these? <laughs> and it was just so amazing, you know. She was, she was up at this event, I'd kind of dragged her up there. She was always a willing sport, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Um, not always, because she's not around anymore, but uh, that's, that's another story, it's a joke mostly. But anyway, it, it, was, it was just a wonderful moment for her and everyone else that this, this uh, almost mythical animal insect we were talking about, uh, she found it right there and suddenly she was like the star of the day. And it was, it's, it's a wonderful memory. So um, you can find wonder, water scorpions in our area if you look hard enough for them. Um, Abetus, uh, also the, the genus Bellostoma. Um, I have found them in Oregon and Washington. Uh, no fishing spiders up in our area, but you can find various water spiders. Um, ones that uh, live in riparian habitats at the creek edge and river edges. Um, um, and uh, it's wonderful that you teach about those things. I, I would like to hear what uh, specific questions you might have about them. And I assume that I could probably learn a lot from you, Shane, about them and uh, about the ones that we see here locally um, because there are just so many and I'm learning new things all the time. So uh, that concludes the first round of questions that I'm gonna answer. I think we might've hit around the two hour mark there. I'm gonna definitely have to divide this up into multiple videos. Um, thank you guys for sitting through all of this with me. I enjoyed answering the questions as I've said a few times. I hope that you've enjoyed hearing my answers to your questions. Uh, it's always a lot of fun. I think that this is a pretty unique experience for myself and you guys. Um, I'm glad that we found each other because um, this is just a lot of fun and I think that I am able to um, provide information on the topics of pet bugs in a way that, um, you know, uh, dead insect collectors can't. And I'm able to provide information for dead insect collectors um, in the ways of taxonomy and the classifications of things in a way that a lot of pet bug people can't. Um, I also have the perspective of being an online dealer um, and an insect enthusiast and a nature enthusiast. And I think that allows me to have a perspective that is rare in any other single human being. Although I've met many people who are enthusiasts in all of those ways, just like myself. And those are the guys that I go on the trips with. And those are the people that I love meeting and getting to know. And I know there's lots of you out there. We are all at different stages in becoming that person. 
and uh, I often learn uh, the most through interacting with those other people and uh, that's why I like going on those trips in particular because um, everybody has a set of experiences that they bring to the table, they bring to the trip and the outing um, and uh, it just makes, it just magnifies those orders of magnitude. It makes it so much more interesting than it would be if it were just me and the bugs. So thank you all for that. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up and please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.